Learn why Iowa City's newest city council member is making international headlines. Plus, new changes how rental permits will be granted for single-family homes and duplexes. And we refresh your memory on what to do during a snow emergency. Lastly, get a lesson in etiquette when biking on Iowa City's trail systems. And it all starts right now on this edition of Iowa City in Focus. The new year greets the city council with some familiar faces as well as a new one. Susan Mims and Kingsley Botchway were both successful in securing another term. Filling Terry Dickens' vacated seat is Mazahir Sali, who has been gaining international attention with her win. She's become the first known Sudanese American to hold an elected office in the U.S. I sat down with Mazahir to get to know her journey to the city council. Can you begin by explaining your path to the U.S. and how you ended up here in Iowa City? I came to this country back in 1997. I remember it was November. And just like an immigrant coming for looking for a better life. Mazahir spent the first 14 years of her life in the U.S. living in Alexandria, Virginia. There she met her future husband and started a family. After earning citizenship, getting married, and having five kids, it was a desire to further her education that brought Mazahir to Iowa City. And I was looking up online for uh, and uh, it's cool that I can go to because I was interested in doing uh, electro neurodiagnostic technology, which is like measuring the brain wave. And while I was looking, I interestingly, it's only 23 calling in the whole United States does this kind of a study. In Iowa, there is two calling have this program. So the Salee family moved to Iowa City, but not with the intention of making this their permanent home. Promises all my friends in Virginia. I guess gonna take me two years and I will be back. But since when I came here, I started like really fell in love with Iowa. The people in, in this community really treating me very good in the beginning. The first weekend, I met my first Iowan friend and we become friends until now. Yes, love the city really and uh, decided to make it home and uh, because really that was how it felt. I felt this is home for us and I decided not to go back. And since you've been in our community, You've been an organizer for a variety of different efforts. Can you talk a little bit about your advocacy work? The youngest child that I have, at that time he was almost three years old, but he doesn't go to preschool or anything. I just took him and we went to the Crowfield Public Library and I started seeing people look like me, and people wearing a scarf, and they going downstairs to the library. And I said, what's going on? Let me go downstairs and see that. And I went downstairs, I just found like people from different countries, people from Iowa, just sitting down together to trying to figure out like uh, what they can do about issues in the community. And those things is really my area of passion. I like those kind of things because I've been doing some uh, advocacy work and like uh, in, in Virginia too. And I just start like engaging with those people and together we found the Center for Worker Justice later on. The Center for Workers' Justice was founded in 2012. Since that time, Mazahir has served as vice president and president of the organization and is currently acting as a community organizer for the group. The organization helped raise minimum wage in Johnson County to 10 10 an hour. And when the state legislature passed a bill that froze the minimum wage at $7.25 an hour last year, essentially removing the county's right to govern wages, the center jumped into action to ensure that higher paying jobs remained. So far we signed up almost uh, 150 businesses. They committed voluntarily to keep paying their employees, current employees and future employees, the county minimum wage 1010, which is make me feel we are in the right community and this is good people and those businesses are moving this community forward together. The group also helped champion the Johnson County Community ID program which allows access to local services for immigrants and others without documentation needed to obtain a state-issued ID. And for years now, this community ID is improving the relationship between the local enforcement and the minority, which is really great. Other accomplishments include recovering money for those who have experienced wage theft, confronting discrimination, and fighting for affordable housing. That last issue is at the top of her priorities as she joins City Council. I will really advocate for affordable housing because I think this is really crisis in Iowa City. And it's my own crisis. Like, for three years ago, I was looking for the house that I live in right now. It took me months of searches to find that house, and it's not affordable. There is many people here pay more than 50% of their income just to board rent 
or mortgage and utilities. We need to do something about that. Mazahir says another goal is to create economic development for all, with a focus on livable wages and new job opportunities. In order to do that, she says the city must improve another service. Transportation. You know, transportation is really a big deal for students, for elderly people, for low-wage workers. For just by speaking to all those people, I find out we need to string our transportation system. We need to have uh, transportation on Sundays. And after also 8 o'clock, some area doesn't have transportation. Second shift people, they're complaining because they cannot get to work. Since you were elected, you've become a bit of an international celebrity. We've recorded some forums and some programs that you were in that have been viewed worldwide, especially in Sudan. You just got back from a trip there. What was it like with your newfound celebrity? You know, to tell you the truth, from the beginning when I announced to run for city council, I was not at all have any idea this is will grab national attention at all. But after I won and I found out this is, I will be the first Sudanese Americans to get elected in an office in the whole United States. That shocked me as, as much as it surprised me and made me excited, really. When I went to Sudan, I just went there to bring my mother, and I went there actually for two weeks. They made me stay three weeks because there is many demand from many local people, like local TVs. They want me to come and talk about this experience. You're in high demand. Yeah, and it's really, really people are very excited. They make me feel this is really big deal. I wasn't feel that a lot, you know. I know that I'm passionate about it. I need to be one of the people who can make a change in this city. And, and, and that's all, in, like here. But now, other people are looking at me doing this. Uh, this is really a big responsibility. Well, that kind of a passion and engagement is what makes our community great. Exactly, yeah. Mazahir, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me, and best of luck with your work on the City Council. Thank you so much. Looking forward to serve this awesome community, and yes, to make it work for everyone, regardless where they born in this country, or they just travel half of the globe like me to be in Iowa City. The goal of the Climate Action Steering Committee is to create a plan for climate action and adaptation and mitigation for Iowa City. Tonight was a way for the community to participate and let their voices be heard about what they think is important in regards to climate action for Iowa City and what they think that they can do in regards to climate action for Iowa City. As a member of 100grannies.org, we are very invested in climate change and doing something about it. This was an opportunity to find out how we can help the city do more. I'm very happy that we came together planning for the future and uh, increasing the wellness by collaborating, communicating, and co-creating a safer uh, planet. We were astounded by the amount of people that came, the amount of participation. Iowa City is headed in the right direction with this plan and that we will be able to implement this plan because of the amount of community participation. I think we're going to do wonderful things. Overall, this looks like a good start and we need to get with it. Keeping a healthy balance of mixed housing has always been a priority of the city. So when the state legislature decided to take away a primary tool to regulate the rental of homes, our staff had to go back to the drawing board. Now, a new system is in place that is designed to protect neighborhood stability. We realize that we need all sorts of housing types in our immediate downtown area, so we just want to try and keep the playing field level between all groups. Under Iowa City's previous code, a rental permit would be required for a single family home when it was a family plus one roomer or three unrelated people living in the house. Regulation was based on family status, but that is a tool that is no longer available. Last year, the state legislature removed our ability to regulate occupancy based on familial status. This was used to regulate density and overcrowding in single-family homes and duplexes. 
So with the bill removing that option taking effect in 2018, the city began researching other recourse. So at that time, we had to start looking for a new way to promote healthy neighborhoods and protect the stability of our neighborhoods. That included the idea of a rental cap, which could be enforced in designated neighborhoods. We looked at neighborhoods in Iowa City that we consider healthy. Specifically, the Longfellow neighborhood has a good balance of owner-occupied units and rental units. The city drew up boundaries and with the help of the city council, came to an agreement. In these existing neighborhoods, the cap is 30% of only 30% of the single family and duplex dwellings can be rental. This does not impact apartments or multifamily units, just single family homes and duplexes. Also, any rental permits in those designated areas will be grandfathered in. All of the existing rental properties will be allowed to keep their rental permits as long as they stay in good standing with the city. So when does the cap apply? It's enforced when an owner-occupied property changes hands and they try to apply for a new rental permit. We will look at the map, verify what the percentage is in the neighborhood. If we're able, we will uh, give them a rental permit. If not, we will explain to them what the situation is. No more than one tenant is allowed in an owner-occupied property without obtaining a rental permit. Another requirement for new rental units is shared living space. This means bedrooms must not exceed 35% of the finished floor area, ensuring that spaces such as living and dining rooms are not converted into bedrooms. It protects the integrity of these single-family homes. Another new aspect to rental requirements is a good neighbor policy. There are certain expectations that we have of uh, our residents when they're living in our single family neighborhoods. So if you're seeing problems at a rental property related to tenants not shoveling the sidewalk or not mowing the grass or there's trash around the property, with multiple complaints we'll be making contact with the tenants and landlords and explaining to them what the expectations are. This policy will be used to make sure that all pre-existing codes are followed. If it happens on a, a single occasion, you're going to get a letter from the city explaining what uh, the violation was. If it happens multiple times, if it happens two times, there will be time for the tenants and the landlord to come in and talk to the city where the expectations will be clearly laid out for the tenants and the landlord. Failure of the tenants and landlord to stop the infraction from repeating could result in serious ramifications to the rental permit further violations, uh, there will be an expectation that there's a property maintenance program put in place to make sure that those nuisances are mitigated in the future. If the problem persists, that permit could be revoked. So it's important for both renters and landlords to understand this policy. There will also be some zoning changes, most notably a restriction on paving in backyards. This is to address a growing trend of transforming backyards into parking lots. The idea is that there needs to be a balance on the property. And yes, parking is a concern, but you also want to have green space and open space where the residents of the property can be outside. So before adding parking to the rear yard, the homeowner must first submit plans to zoning for approval. With University of Iowa students making up a majority of the renters, the city is aware of the need for affordable housing. The research data showed that the city has cleared way for nearly 3,000 apartment bedrooms that were recently made available or are under construction. This support for additional housing will continue to be a focus for city leaders. So while there's a cap on single family and duplex rentals, it's not a limit on rental properties, it's just a, a limit on single family and duplex. There's over a thousand rental units in multifamily that's coming available in the next year. The city will carefully monitor and regularly revisit this new ordinance. And by working together, we can continue to maintain diverse housing while protecting the stability of our neighborhoods. Winter weather poses many challenges and threats. For the city, keeping the roads clear and safe for drivers is our number one priority. In order to do that, it's crucial that the public be aware of the rules that are put in place when a snow emergency is declared. 
with 3,500 tons of salt in storage and a dozen snow plows ready at any moment. The City of Iowa City Streets crew is ready for winter. An uh, average snow event of maybe six to eight inches, it will take us up to 12 hours to get the roads reopened. But in order to clear the streets during a major snow event, the city needs you to follow the parking rules when a snow emergency is declared. Let's begin by answering the most basic question. How does the city decide when to declare a snow emergency? When we have a storm that's coming that is true to be intense, um, numerous inches, 7 to 10 to 12 inches, we begin to look at the safety on the streets, whether or not there's already an accumulation of ice and snow, whether or not our plow routes will be able to keep those roads safe for our citizens to travel on. By taking all those factors into consideration, the city manager's office makes the final decision. Once a snow emergency has been declared, the next step is to inform you, the public, through as many outlets as possible. Via Facebook, um, radio stations, TV stations, our cable TV, many different ways so that people have plenty of time to move their cars to the proper side of the street or to their driveways, preferably their driveways, during that 48-hour period of uh, snow removal that we're, we'll be doing. Aside from the ways that Carol mentioned, the city also posts all alerts on the homepage of our website. Additionally, we do send out alerts to anyone who subscribes to our e-subscription service. Because snow emergencies impact all drivers, including people from out of town, the city also provides warning signs. At the 12 entrances to the city, we have drop down signs that will, you don't even notice they're there until we have a snow emergency, and it tells you where to go for information. It's bright orange, and once you come into the community and you see that, you begin to realize, guess what, I better be thinking about where I'm parking. The city will allow a minimum of four hours before parking enforcement begins, but it's important that you act quickly. The biggest obstacle is, is when cars are parked directly across from one another and that we're not able to get a truck through that narrow opening that, that's created. So where can you park? For roads where you are normally allowed to park on both sides of the street, drivers will have to alternate which side of the street they park on based on the calendar date. So we've declared a snow emergency on Tuesday the first of the month. So that's the odd side of the street. So um, you'll need to park your car on the odd side of the street for that day. Um, on the second day of the snow emergency, which would be the second, it's on the even side of the street and that's the side of the street that you're going to park your car on. Drivers must still follow all posted signs during a snow emergency, meaning there is not an exception for streets where parking is only allowed on one side of the street or prohibited altogether. You must still follow those rules. If you don't, you will prevent snowplow drivers from doing their jobs. If it looks too tight, the operator will not go there and therefore the street will remain unplowed. The city does offer some additional parking options for drivers. We have parking ramps that will be open during that period of time so that you can move your car off street. Overnight is free parking. Also our city parks, Mercer Park, City Park, and Happy Hollow will be plowed so that you can move your vehicle to that site over that period and not be worried about getting your car plowed in or possibly being hit by somebody coming down the street sliding. We understand that snow emergencies can be a hassle for those who use on-street parking, but keeping our streets clear and safe for travel is our number one priority. Best to get your cars off the street, uh, use your driveway or a neighbor's driveway or any place but in the street area during the, the worst of the storm so that we can make an efficient pass and stay ahead of the problems created when there isn't a clear path. Because the roads need to be cleared in case of an emergency, if you fail to follow these rules, your vehicle will be towed at your expense. There's a $50 ticket. After the ticket, you'll have towing fees. After the towing fees, you could be up to $200. And so the important thing is to very beginning, as soon as you hear that there's a snow emergency, to start looking at where you're gonna put your vehicle. Towing is a last resort, but being prepared is key to avoiding this worst case scenario. The best thing you can do is have a plan prepared for when winter weather brings its worst. Stay alert whenever there's a snow event that there could be the, the need for a snow emergency which requires everyone's cooperation. Iowa City has a lot of great outdoor space, a lot of trails that we would like people to be out using all year round. Unless otherwise marked, trails are open to everyone, pedestrians, bicyclists, and all users at the same time. When walking or biking on a trail, you should remain on the right side unless you are in the process of passing someone. 
Always pass on the left and alert those you intend to pass by ringing your bell or simply saying, on your left, as you approach. Bicyclists should ride at a reasonable speed and yield to slower and oncoming traffic. If riding or walking in a group, use no more than half the trail. Be cautious when crossing driveways, streets, sidewalks, and other trails. And don't forget to obey all traffic signals and signs. Be courteous, share the trails, be safe. Next time on Iowa City in Focus, we'll take a look at a big grant the Iowa City Police Department is getting to combat domestic assault, sexual violence, and stalking. And let us know what topics you would like to see covered in future shows. Email us at info at citychannel4.com or reach out to us on Facebook by liking the City of Iowa City government page. Tune back in next month for another edition of Iowa City in Focus. Thank you.